Hello, my name is Sassidi Triacuzio, and I'm reading today from my home, located on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Banzer, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapu, Malala, and many other tribes, otherwise known as Portland, Oregon. I'll be reading an excerpt from my memoir, Honey and Vinegar, Recipe for an Outlaw, and I'm starting about two thirds into the book. It's the early 90s, I'm in college and have recently come out, and I'm headed to San Francisco for a structured summer of queer education and exploration. Queer activist training camp. The truck is faded red, but his smile is brilliant. Will is also headed to the activist gathering and has scooped me up along the way. The day passes in laughter and conversation and miles rolling easy under the wheels on this road to discovery. Belted in between us is the little girl I've been nannying, on her way to her grandparents for the summer, listening to us sometimes, but mostly watching the desert change colors outside the window. We pull into a road stop for lunch, smoke a joint on the tailgate while she stretches tiny legs in big looping circles, like the topography lines of the map we check our exits on. We drive on for hours, dusk floating down over the old mountains so slowly we share another three years worth of personal story before the stars show through. Leaving her shining in the middle of a crowd of cousins, we turn the hood toward San Francisco and transformation. Will is clearly comfortable in his body in a way I barely remember. He knows his beauty, but doesn't bother to look for it in the mirror, talks of lovers as if they are plentiful, gently corrects my language when I stumble. He makes this enormous adventure feel safe and doesn't disappear even when we get to the city full of beautiful boys. I take dozens of photos of him tagging along on walks full of sunlight and surprise kisses. They put us all up in college dorms and we're paired off in rooms with much laughter about the ridiculous overlap of our queer truths and the university's rules about gender. I'm sharing a room with an androgynous lesbian who seems as confused by me as I am or maybe that's just me tripping over myself again. Even in this crowd of colorful, cheerful deviants, I still feel other, still feel myself hovering at the edges, watching for clues on how to be. I gravitate towards other fringe dwellers in the room, finding out they are often also perverts and bookworms and outlaws and geeks. We swap skills for organizing protests and safe sex, praise one another's costumes and vocabulary of curses, tumble into a curious pile of nerve endings in BDSM one afternoon to learn about power and hedonism and taking turns. We are unsure, we are jubilant, we are tearful, we are loud. In the afternoons we meet in caucus and I'm the last one to pick myself for a team every time. I live in the overlaps and they are knots of certainty. I try to participate but mostly listen. And when we're done, I seek a quiet place to absorb it all. Sitting alone on balconies, in spots of shade behind large boulders, in small, empty rooms. I don't want to miss a moment of it, but I'm oversaturated. Too many choices after making myself fit into a small world. The experience is enormous and dense patchwork of political actions and contemplative conversations rubbing our various levels of radical against one another while we seek common language and potential for collaboration. While we learn there is no utopia. While we rage against racist bar owners and homophobic newspapers and every level of government as the wave of death floods our community. We weep together as the quilt is laid out in a million squares of heartbreak and lives cut short. We scream together at the sky. We strip down naked and swim together in the private pool of a rich lesbian who lives among the redwoods, more breasts and cunts and cocks than many of us have ever seen, regardless of which we long for. We splash and sing and laugh as if we're in no danger at all, almost believing it for one long sun-drenched afternoon. We later stake out a spot on the public beach for watching fireworks and shout down a few bigots who can't seem to count. In the evenings, our elders come, performers and poets and philosophers, fairies and flannel and firebrands, bringing stories we thought we were only just now writing and reminders of how to maybe survive them. We listen to Pansy Division, 
read yellowed and brittle copies of the Mattachine Review and the latter and debate topics like separatism, homogenization, and language. We take our classes in a UU church just off Castro and have two hours a day to wander the neighborhood. It's all rainbow all the time, glorious and freeing and increasingly highlighting the tiny, dim, and painstakingly carved out cave I usually exist in. In Tucson, you're gay or lesbian, country or rock, androgynous or slightly less so. There, my femme gender is invisible, especially when I pick up a power tool and my desire for multiple partners makes me suspect in every group. The summer is winding down and I never want to be less than I am right this minute, but I can already feel myself holding back and shrinking back down. On Our Backs invites a group of the dyke identified folks to do an erotic photo shoot and I can't think of anything I'd rather do. And I can imagine the explosion of it colliding with Linda's paranoia and suspicion. I opt out knowing that the compromises won't stop there but lost as to how to reconcile it all. I hope I've intrigued you. This is Honey and Vinegar. Thank you so much to Saints and Sinners for having me as part of this reading series and to everyone that is tuning in. Hi, my name is Farzana Doctor and I'm coming to you from Toronto, Canada. And I'll be reading from my novel Seven, which came out in fall 2020. And this is a story about um, a middle-aged South Asian woman who goes to India on a marriage saving trip with her husband and seven-year-old daughter. And she thinks she's gonna be spending the majority of her time homeschooling her kid and doing some research about um, an ancestor, her great-great-grandfather. But what ends up happening is she's there in 2016 when some pretty big political debates are happening in her small insular religious community. And these debates are about some gender-based violence. So I'll just start with page five. In the evening, Mortiza and I meet on the couch for the married person's evening ritual, TV. Along with a nightly bowl of microwave popcorn, we've been putting away two episodes of the Mindy Project after Z is in bed. We guffaw and cringe in the same places. We are diasporic South Asian children of immigrants communing over the embarrassing life of a diasporic South Asian child of immigrants. While the credits roll, Mortiza leans over, kisses my neck and says, shall we turn it off now or watch another episode? Sure, Morty, we can turn it off, I say, sensing his preference. After all, it is Saturday and 9 p.m. I'd prefer to hit play, to be distracted by someone else's awkward world, but I appreciate my husband's good natured and consistent initiative taking. My friends and I talk about our lackluster sex lives and waning libidos, and I feel like I'm the lucky one amongst us. At least we can say we are still doing it, rather than being in couples therapy because we aren't, or breaking up because we aren't, or having extramarital affairs because we aren't. I'd never cheated in my life, neither on a test nor a timesheet. When my naturopath directed me to eliminate sugar, dairy, wheat, and caffeine last year to improve my immune system's functioning, I followed her instructions to the letter for 60 days. How to make sense of the affair then? It was just over four years ago when Z was three. Ian, a guy I once slept with, friend requested me on Facebook. I recall experiencing a twinge of something, a flutter in my belly that I could have interpreted as a prescient warning. I brushed away the sensation and thought, nah, it's just Facebook and it's been ages since we last saw each other. Plus, I'd heard from a friend in common that he'd moved to England. I thought we'd share a few likes, perhaps a little lurking, no problem. At the time, I couldn't admit to myself that it was cheating. There, was, there were no secret liaisons in two and a half star motels we'd paid for in cash. 
No late night phone calls, no sexy photos. Leave it to me to have an affair without really having an affair. And I'm gonna skip forward. Interspersed um, throughout this book are scenes from Sharifa that was the protagonist, her great, great grandfather. So I'll just read one short excerpt from him. His name is Abdulali. And this happens in January, 1866 in South Bombay. 11 year old Abdulali huddled under the yellow glow of a street lamp, his index finger pacing his labored reading. The lion lives in the jungle, he whispered. His roar is loud. An elderly fruit seller trudged by with an empty wooden cart pulled by a weary bullock. Just in time, Abdulali wrapped his legs around the post to avoid a heavy hoof landing on his toe. A fly, one of the bullock's many winged passengers, hopped onto his hand and then onto the Hindi primary reader he had borrowed from Sunil, the nine-year-old boy of the family for whom he worked. He had told his mother it was a gift. Did she believe the lie? Thinking of her, it seemed, could summon her. He looked up and saw her face framed in the window of the third floor room they shared with another widow and her three young children. He fanned, she fanned herself with her orna. Despite the evening's cool, the day's heat lingered in the room. He waved to her and pleaded, five more minutes, mummy. She nodded, her lips a straight line but he knew she was proud of him, knew they had left the village for a better life. And for now, their better life was just this, one nicked book about a lion in a jungle that he struggled word by word to understand. Thanks so much, saints and sinners, and thank you all for listening. Have a wonderful festival, and I hope to see you next year. Hi, this is Stephanie Glazier from Detroit. I'll be reading three poems from a collection called Of Fish and Country. The first is called, And If a Man Comes with a Gun, Ars Poetica. At the women's shelter, the gardener, wrinkled and with folded papers, gets up to make his speech. Kids eating broccoli, their mothers journaling on benches after therapy, a story of the woman with the sunflowers knowing because of their beauty, that her life would find its way, if this, then this. Teaching in the morning we review, a simile is a comparison using like or as. Remember, you are bright like sunflowers to me. Personification is giving something non-human human abilities, the toys in Toy Story, the book we read where the crayons quit, like that, I mean not like that. The radio tells me about the children in Texas, long stretching hours in their seats and then no more. Here, mine are a field of common light no one thought to shoot today. God, let them be a field. Let them be a field. Let them be a field. This next poem is in sections and I'm just gonna pause between the sections. On the use of garments. My mother was a god in the summers, Christ in a white skirt hosting the saints. While she turned away from her father's love for me, she lavished herself on hosta, dahlia, succulent, azalea. You hear it spoken about like a decision made. I've forgiven them, they'll say, of a cheating heart, a cruel daughter. I'm driving to her now in a thick red cream dress I bring plants, not flower, some thick leaved thing she's asked for. In the story, Jesus the oblivious walks with his men and she, nameless and hemorrhaging, reaches out for grace. Her father gave me a purple robe in which some years of my life remain, a rich petal that kept me a long time, a girl. 
And this last piece is called Bolero. There's a blanched picture of me holding a single frond many times my size. Stray, I'd lifted it to feel the weight and for the camera. We'd come on Transmillennial maybe an hour and argued. And when we found the gardens at the gates with the fountains and juice stands, her voice went over the water. Ingrata, she screamed, threw the keys to the flat and walked into the city. I've bent over the books that once I let be my good ideas. Bell hooks and from love as extension of the self for spiritual growth. We'd go on to see couples' initials carved into the trunks of towering heirloom cacti, and for years this way, you standing in front of the door, the car, you, sorry, a dinner party, you out into a January night with no coat and one shoe. Forgiveness is a halting and changing, of course, every time I thought no to this and then I'd get in the car with the coat. We moved to Detroit, the summer came on and Aretha Franklin died. Between seven and eight, Woodward was a mile of pink Cadillacs, the medians full of people singing, oh, I thought, this is love. Thank you for having me at Saints and Sinners. Well, hello there. My name's Sinjin Carr, and you're probably wondering how I keep my hair so lustrous and vibrant. Well, the answer's right here. It's, oh, 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 look at this. It's my novel, Quake City. Oh, uh, sorry, what's that? Is it available from fine bookstores everywhere? Yes, it is. Thank you for asking. Today, I'm going to be doing a reading for you from chapter one. So here we go. I don't want to go to a party, says Tom. I arch an eyebrow at him skeptically. Yes, look at this. No one can withstand the eyebrow. I am crueler than Cruella de Vil, and more magnificent than Maleficent. Tom shrieks and withers under the shade my eyebrow is throwing at him, begging me for mercy, apologizing through his tears for being so depressingly heterosexual and refusing to go to one teeny tiny party. Or at least he would be, if he was looking at me. But he's still lying on my couch with his head on the armrest, browsing kinkbitches.com on his phone. I hold my eyebrow arched like that for a second in case he looks up and I can pretend I've just done it. Look at me. Look at me. My face muscles start spasming. I drop the eyebrow and rub the side of my face, pretending it never happened. I don't know why I bother trying to have facial expressions for Tom. He even ignores the one I call the Judgment of Meredith. Look it. See? It's all on the eyebrows and the lips. You don't know who Meredith is, but you know she's judging you. She's judging you for all your dumbass ideas and weird music. I imagine Tom has just told me Grace Jones is a second-rate singer. Come the fuck on. Who doesn't like Grace Jones? She's a goddess. Fucking Tom. Wouldn't know sexy if it came in his face. Who does he think he is, anyway? Fuck you, Tom, I shout. You think this is all about you, but it isn't. You know? It just isn't. Tom's so startled he loses his grip on the phone and drops it on his nose. I would laugh, but Meredith is still too angry with him. What do I do now, he says, giving me a sideways scowl. You know what you said, you son of a bitch. All I said was I don't want to go to a party. Ah, oh, right, the party. I put my angry face away for the time being, but the ghost of Meredith still haunts my eyebrows. Tom's all right looking, I guess, if you're into that kind of thing. Though his hair is always too long and his hands are too rough from climbing mountains or wrestling goats or whatever it is straight people do all day. Now he's trying to act like a party such a huge big deal. If he's gonna crash on my couch and mooch my hospitality for a week, the least he can do is come with me. Tough, I say, you have to go. There's only one key so you won't be able to get back in without me. So I won't go out. What if there's a fire? Then I'll die, he says. I don't even know what you're saying to me right now. Why are you gonna be so freaking weird about it? I turn away from him to check myself in the mirror. Do these jeans make my ass look big? I can tell he's not looking, but he answers, massive. Never underestimate the power of the ass. I never have, he says. I turn to give him a few of it and flex one cheek after the other doing an accent. Tom, look deep into my eye. I will hypnotize you with my sexy power. But he's not paying attention, so I do another voice. Oh, well, what's this? My stars, I appear to have dropped my handkerchief. I better bend over and pick it up before I get an attack of the vapors. I bend over in front of him and give him a face full of my magnificent ass. He looks at me and says, what kind of party is this anyway? It's a gay party. Ah, oh, he says, rolling his face into the sofa. What you mean is there's no chicks and I'm gonna spend the whole night being latched on by queens. What am I supposed to do all night? 
Oh my God, it's like you have no idea how this even works. Listen up, Thomas. Women love the gays, and more importantly, they don't seem to mind that we don't give a flying fuck about them. It's like you and lesbians. They have what you want, but you're not allowed to have it. We're what women want, and it makes them insane. Who can blame them? Smell me. How can anyone say no to this? I thrust my neck at him so he can appreciate how magical I smell. He wrinkles his nose. It's burning my eyes. The boy is a menace. He doesn't know what's good for him. What I'm saying, tomboy, is that the club is going to be full of lady girls, all horned up and nowhere to go. There might be other straight men there, but you, you have a gay wingman. I give you my personal guarantee, you'll be swimming in tits by the end of the night. Now he starts cracking up, apparently for no reason. Maybe he's having a breakdown. Swimming, he gasps, a little too melodramatically if you ask me. Take it easy, easy, easy there, Liza, you're not up for any Oscars. Like there's a pool full of disembodied tits, is that how this works? An Olympic sized pool, I say, trying to impress, with him, impress him with the scale of what I'm offering him. But now he's just being dumb. Is that what you think straight men want, he asks, then goes all serious. Wait a minute, you think you could pass for straight, don't you? Oh, the shame. Hell's them, yes I could pass for straight. Look, I'll do it right now. Dude, that's totally baller. I'm hella down for some beer pong. I'm gonna saddle up that poontang and ride it over the mountain Gangnam style with a tuba full of brewskis and... Uh, all right, I have no idea what I'm saying anymore. My straight impression died a sudden death, but between you and me, for the first two, maybe two and a half seconds, I was a star. It's uncanny, says Tom. I nod. Clearly, I'm starting to get through to him. Aren't you getting ready, I ask? I am ready, he says. Can you believe it? He's lying there in his baggy running shorts and black tank top like he was raised by wolves. Though he does actually look okay in them in a perverse gangbanger slash frat boy kind of way. I swear with a bit of grooming and a nose hair trim, he'd clean up to a seven, maybe an eight with rounding. But I'm not gonna let this fly. I see what you're trying to do, I say. You're gonna make this hard for me. It's fine, I like a challenge. You can dress like a Soviet bag lady if you like. I'm still gonna get you laid by the end of the night. With a girl, right? Oh, well, right if you insist. Honestly, I don't know how you ever get laid if you're this picky all the time. Sometimes I don't even know why we're friends. I make you feel less like the crushing inevitabilities of life are bearing down upon you. Yeah, he's a real funny motherfucker. All right then, I say. Let's go. Ladies and gents, you've been fantastic. Um, I want to say thank you in particular to the Saints and Sinners Literary Festival for making this wonderful thing happen during a pandemic. And I hope I will get to see you all in person next year. Thanks very much and have fun at the festival. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on your time zone. My name is Bruce Skeef, and I'm coming to you from Stratford, Ontario, about two hours west of Toronto. A year ago, when we all got locked down for the first time, in our case, it was for about 20 weeks, there were a group of friends that I definitely didn't want to lose touch with it. So every Friday morning, I wrote them sort of a, a newsletter about what had been going on with me the week before. I found that a lot of these also started including stories about things from my past. One thing happening right now would jog my memory about something else. The idea was to, to, to spend a few minutes on something that was not awful. Uh, so the rules were no politics and no talk about the virus. And it, it served its purpose. My friends were asking me if I had ever thought of collecting these stories and putting them into a book. So that's where I am right now. I'm thinking about doing that and, and seeing if there's any interest. So one of these stories is from last November 26th. I was in the middle of getting ready to move from Toronto to Stratford where I am now. So the title of this was The Last Martini, Tales of the Church Street Bars. Hi guys, good morning. What a week this has been, eh? These are my last notes from Toronto. Stratford notes begin next Friday. So I'm suggesting I entitle this one, The Last Martini, Tales of the Church Street Bars. I thought it might be appropriate as I sat on a nice mild afternoon last Thursday on the patio at Boutique Bar after a busy several hours of sorting and packing. It was expected that last Friday the Ontario government would put Toronto in lockdown, and indeed they did. 
So both because of that and because I'm moving, this was to be the last martini. Looking out at all the passing people on the sidewalk, I started thinking about all the people I'd met and the experiences I'd had in the bars on Church Street in the last 28 years. Among them, my first visit to the Black Eagle when it was young and the dress code was rigid. At the International AIDS Conference of 1996 in Vancouver, I'd hung out with attendees from CANFAR, ACT, and the Toronto PWA Foundation. I had the HIV AIDS communications portfolio at the Ontario Ministry of Health, and I sat on the minister's advisory committee on HIV AIDS. After the conference back in Toronto, in a phone call, the PWA guys invited me to come out for a pint after work at the Eagle. But I'm in a suit and tie, I reminded them. Oh, don't worry, we'll get you in, we'll get you in. They lied. So after work, in a light gray summer wool suit and a silk necktie, I climbed the stairs, saw them at the bar, and got a withering look from the bartender, bare chested except for a black leather vest. Oh, never mind him. He's from out of town. He's with us. He's from out of town. They lied again. Well, yeah, nice, nice try, guy. Uh, but the barman served me begrudgingly, only because I was there with a couple of well-known regulars, and it was only 5 p.m. These days, you can see closeted out-of-town businessmen climb the stairs and go inside in daylight in Bermuda shorts and trainers. And at night, a lots of Twinkies, some of the girlfriends on the dance floor. Everybody's had to bend to make a buck. Then there was a time a group of friends and I were having a drink after work at Sailor's Bar. Someone at our table started nudging elbows and nodding his head towards the bar. Getting a pint was Lorne Saxburg, the handsomest man on CBC TV news. Everybody's eyes popped wide, even more so when he started walking over to us. Hi, Bruce. Mind if I sit down with you guys? I knew Lorne from work. Sure, Lorne, and I introduced everybody. There was an election coming up, and he joined right in with the conversation that we'd been having on the likely outcome. Not only gorgeous, and well-spoken. After all, he was a national news anchor for many years, but thoughtful, sweet, and good company. And what a voice, sonorous, deep, yet relaxed. The poor guy died several years later in a snorkeling accident on vacation in Thailand. He was only 47. And then there was the guy whose name I never knew, who still tends to win me the what's the most public sex you've ever had bar conversation. In Woody's, on a jam-packed Pride weekend night a long time ago, I was sitting at the bar talking to the guy beside me. When I got up to use the bathroom, he followed right behind me and into the cubicle with definitely dishonorable intentions in mind. Attempts at washroom blowjobs, mostly unsuccessful, were still common in those days. Staff were on patrol, bang, bang, bang on all the cubicle doors. Everybody chased out. On the way back to the bar, I guess the guy got impatient. And in, in the middle of this large room, in a full crowd with not an inch between sweaty bodies, he dropped to his knees, unzipped me, and the rest is history. And the funny thing was, it was so crowded, nobody even noticed. Oh, and I still say oral counts as sex, unless you're Bill Clinton, I suppose. And there are many other stories, 28 years, and this was my last martini as a frequent denizen of the village. After this, just an out of town visitor, I took a last sip, and headed for the subway station. 
Yes, the one where Uncle Herb and Aunt Mary's mansion stood for decades before. How a neighborhood and the uses we make of it can change. Well, it's time to get this day on the road. I'm driving to Stratford tomorrow and picking up my keys and doing a few other things. So these are my last notes from Toronto. Next notes from Stratford next week. Cheers, guys. And thank you to you for listening. Hi there, I am Jennifer Style, and I'm speaking to you from Tashkent, Uzbekistan today. And I'm going to be reading to you from my new novel, Exile Music, uh, which is the story of Jewish refugees fleeing Vienna for the mountains of Bolivia in 1939 and their family of musicians. I'm gonna start right from the beginning, Overture. When I think of Austria, I remember what a child remembers. Details as vivid as the bright shards of a dream. The coffee warmed air of the kitchen, the rough fabric of my father's suits against my cheek, the chalk dust of my classroom tickling my nose, the ice crusted snow in the Jesuitvisa meadow that cut my eyebrow open when I fell off the toboggan halfway down the slope. My Annalisa. My parents' voices in the kitchen as I hovered, still and silent by the door, secretly listening. It was important then to listen. I remember the tang of my mother's apricot jam spread over a thick layer of butter on crusty bread, the fungal stink of my older brother's dirty sports clothing on the bathroom floor, the earthy scent of the square olive oil soap that was always slipping into the sink. I remember a plum tree in our small communal garden that dropped its sour sweet fruit onto our terrace. They were a dark dusty purple, more oval than the green ones we would eat in Bolivia. In Vienna, Annalisa's mother collected the dropped fruits and used them to make torts. I remember my mother's voice in our parlor, starting off low and gathering the energy to soar. I remember the scent of rosin on horsehair, the vibrations of my father's viola, how I could feel the notes on my skin even after he stopped playing and I was in bed, listening only to the silence. I remember the inky smell of my school books as I cracked their spines, the sound of Frau Fessler's ruler smashing into my desk when she caught me with a book on my lap during math class the way the fruit gummies from vices get stuck in my back teeth, so I had to pick them out with my fingernails. I remember the damp heat of Annalisa's hand as she folded it with mine for the last time. I remember our neighbor's long coats decorated with flocks of badges saying only, ya. Yeah. The swastikas on every armband and flag pinned to every lapel painted on our sidewalks. They even fell from the sky, flurries of paper spiders dropping onto our heads. I remember the newspapers my parents hid from me under sofa cushions. I remember lying awake, twisting the satiny border of my blanket in my fingers until my mother came and curled around me. I remember her breath on my neck, the ice of her fingers on my spine, stroking my skin until I drifted into dreams. The bland quotidian details, the textures of ordinary days, seared themselves most permanently, except for Annalisa. Annalisa, who was neither bland nor ordinary. Annalisa, who was more part of me than not. Our mothers had birthed us in the same building a week apart, and from then on, there were no divisions between us. The four syllables of her name were my first song. I remember Frieden Glukasenland. We imagined the place into existence long before the Anschluss, when we were small and preliterate, as we lay sprawled on our stomachs on the floor of her kitchen, scribbling with our pencils on the back of brown paper from the grocers. Where do you think we lived before this? She looked up at me with large dark eyes. We have always been here, Anna. We've never been anywhere but here. Our families had lived in the same apartments in the same building owned by my grandfather since we were born. I thought for a moment, 
I guess before here we were in our mother's bellies. No, I mean before we lived in our mother's bellies. Nowhere, I said. The belly's where we start. Annalisa shook her head, the ends of her long hair dancing across the paper. How could we not have existed? We must have been somewhere. She traced the outline of her lips with the rubber end of her pencil as she gazed at the ceiling. At the left corner of her mouth, a faint scar curved upward so that even at rest, her lips suggested a smile. I know where I was, she said definitively. I was in Friedenglukhausenland. Friedenglukhausenland. Peace, happiness, and rabbits all stuck together in a single word to make a place. I stared at her. I was pretty sure that I hadn't existed before I emerged from my mother in some bloody and uncomfortable way she described in only the vaguest of terms. But I wanted to have always been with Annalisa. I wanted to have come from the same place, to belong to the same land. Was I there? I looked at the rabbit lying next to me. Was Lebkuchen? She looked at me, her eyes drifting to a world only she could see. Don't you remember? We lived in a palace with Muti Haza, the mother of all bunnies. She was the queen, she still is. She's about a million years old, no, a billion. She's the wisest person in the world. She knows the names of all the dinosaurs and has lived on all the planets. She can talk to trees and turn herself invisible. She has two other children, Alexia and Nicola. Do you remember them? I closed my eyes. I remember Alexia's red hair. She began to take shape in my mind, tall and thin. They were both dancers, Russian dancers. Until Nikola started drinking too much wine. He could have been so famous, but he began putting wine on everything. He even put wine sauce on his vegetables. Annalisa glanced toward the bottles clustered near her family's waste bin, her father's bottles. He couldn't balance on his toes anymore. But not Alexia, I added quickly, anxious to save one of them. Not Alexia. There was a Fatihaza too, wasn't there? Yes, only he died, but not of old age. My belly tightened as I thought of all the ways I was discovering that daddies could die. He died of silliness, I offered. Yes. He decided to be a soldier, but he didn't kill anyone, and so they killed him. It was silly of him to become a soldier. My brother Willie wanted to be a soldier and the prospect of his absence was gnawing away at me like a hungry rat. Your daddy was a soldier. I know, that's what I just said. No, your real daddy, your Vienna daddy. I know. Like most Austrian men his age, my father had served in the great war. He'd even received a medal with cross swords on the back reserved for frontline troops or the wounded. Aren't you proud of him? I shrugged. My father never talked about the war. I guess. I'd just rather there were no soldiers, none at all. My father made sense only as a creator of music, not as a uniformed killer. Annalisa bent her neck so our foreheads touched. I could feel the warmth of her breath against my lips, her eyes so close they blurred together. There are no soldiers in Friedenglukhausenland, she whispered. No one can get in. The country is surrounded by stone walls, and when invaders try to get in, the wind just blows their hands off the doorknob. There are no cars either, I whispered back. That way we can run across the streets whenever we want without looking. It's so quiet there, you can hear the apples dropping off the trees. We can hear the moles tunneling into the earth. We can even hear the hairs of the rabbits brushing together when they hop. I closed my eyes. I have never wanted to be anywhere as much as I wanted to be in Friedenglukhausenland then. No one is lazy and everyone walks everywhere. We lay there, eyes closed, our foreheads pressed so close, I felt our skin would grow together, that we could become one girl. Orly, we have always existed. Thank you, saints and sinners, so much for having me. I hope I get to be with you in person next time. Thank you. Goodbye. Hello, sinners and saints. My name is David Witchman, and I'm coming from 
sunny Palm Springs, California, and I'm here to read a little bit from my book, Every Grain of Sand. And this is where I try my hand at some survival sex work uh, in the midst of my addiction and in the height of the AIDS epidemic. One afternoon, my pager went off. And knowing I'd soon have some cash in my pocket, I ran to the payphone to call the client. A quiet, husky voice came on the line. Are you coming over or not? Confused by his abrupt demand, I said, Why are you asking me this? I don't even know who you are. You said you were coming over, but you haven't been over here yet. I've been waiting here all day. I haven't gotten any pages or talked to you at all. Well, are you coming over or not? It would help if maybe you told me where you lived. We had this whole argument, and I was so desperate for money to get high that I didn't care the guy sounded half crazy. At the time, I had to pay extra to have a picture of myself in the paper, so no one knew what I looked like. A caller interested in hiring me would usually ask for a description. I'd say, I'm 5'11", 135 pounds. I usually top and rarely bottom. Some spiel already laid out. I never described an actual sexual act, but rather said, I'm open to most scenes. It kept us from the obvious legal issues, but I had agreed to go to this guy's place without even discussing money or what he was into. He lived at the top of Corbett Street in Twin Peaks. The 37 Corbett bus dropped off at the large wooden staircase that climbed forever up a steep hill. I walked up the interminable steps to his building and rang the doorbell. A few seconds later, I could hear coughing and heavy breathing and shuffling of feet. When the door opened, standing in front of me was a man not yet 30, but already a living skeleton draped in wizened skin. Wisps of hair on his bare scalp flickered in the late afternoon breeze. I knew instantly I was looking at a man dying of AIDS. Oh my God. Are you okay? I asked. This dead man walking spoke weakly through dry cracked lips. Yes, of course I'm okay. Are you coming in? I better not. I knew what was happening to him and it terrified me. Please stay, he pleaded. I need your help with something anyway. I think I should go. Come on, please stay. He stood there in hospital pajamas and thin cotton robe, tears streaming down his cheeks, clenched in anger. Despite my terror, I felt incredibly sad for him. His palpable loneliness drew me in, and I agreed to go inside. Half of me was there simply because I needed some money, but the other half kept screaming, What the fuck are you doing? I followed him down the front hallway. His home was dirty and unkempt, dishes piled up in the kitchen sink, and the air smelt like baby vomit. No one comes over here anymore. No one wants to touch me. No one wants to be anywhere near me. Not even you. You don't fucking care. He turned to face me, a look in his eyes that dared to prove him wrong. He was so angry and confused, and his pain was so heavy. I could feel it in my bones. I just want to be touched. I just want to be held, just for a moment. Please, fuck me. Deep in my being, a part of me surrendered. I couldn't even imagine what he was experiencing. My head swirled in disbelief. Part of me panicked. Another part of me just ached with heartache. I gathered my senses and put my own emotions in check. I didn't want this man to feel untouchable, not even for a second. Look, let's just lie down and let things happen naturally. No rush. I eased him onto his unmade bed, moving the covers so he'd stay warm. I stretched out beside him and wrapped my arms around his emaciated frame. His lungs crackled with each breath. Despite that I had acquiesced to his wishes, he kept getting up and throwing another fit about how nobody wanted him. I just brought him back to bed each time, taking him into my arms again and again. My thoughts kept wandering off out of my body and back into the room again. Though I felt present in the moment, my addiction was calling, constantly interrupting, beckoning me to fill the vast hole of emptiness inside. Over the next couple of hours, I helped him clean up and brush his teeth. I changed his sheets on his bed. Since I was an incorrigible alcoholic, I always carried around a small flat bottle of peppermint schnapps, which I pulled out of my pocket and handed to him. He took one swig and then vomited all over the kitchen floor. Hmm. Somebody can't hold his liquor, I said, giggling and trying to ease the embarrassment. 
obviously, he shrugged, resigned to his reality. In that moment, he just looked at me with vulnerability and tenderness. I could discern the fear and sadness in his face. I could tell that this was the moment he became aware of himself and his own fragility. He walked toward his bed. I'd been peeking around his apartment to see whether he had any money or something I could steal because I knew the monkey on my back would soon become a gorilla. Not seeing anything of value, I turned the conversation back to the bitter reality. You know I'm an escort, right? He seemed to regain some of his power. He responded sharply, I'll tell you right now I don't have any money, but I do have some drugs. My eyes lit up. Maybe this had been a good call after all. He pulled out a baggie that was supposed to be crystal meth, but it turned out to be baby powder. Someone had been there before me and had taken advantage of him. And that solved the mystery of who was supposed to come over all day. All my hopes collapsed. The gorilla was beating his chest and the call of drugs grew louder. I had to get out of there. We finally laid down again and I held him for a while until he fell asleep. When I started to leave, he woke up and I had to tear myself away. Look, I have to go. I have things to do, I said. I was jonesing hard. I had to get high. My body trembled and my mind raced. Just one hit and I'll be okay. He started to ramble and then he fell asleep. When I walked outside, I felt changed. I felt different. The sadness, <clears throat> the sadness of that experience wrecked me. I roamed the streets shaking to my core. I finally found a friend with some crack and once again I surrendered to the oblivion. Those mundane hours with this total stranger, someone dying alone from AIDS, informed my entire response to this epidemic. This encounter penetrated the dense cloud of my addiction, of my ignorance, and my ability to blot out the truth. Awash in this dying man's loneliness, I discovered a new depth of compassion. I knew I would never let anyone die alone like that. The fear of touching or holding or being close to someone with AIDS simply vanished. Thank you to the Saints and Sinners Festival. Uh, it's a very exciting time. It's the one-year anniversary of my book, and um, I'm so grateful for the time here. Have a great festival, everybody.